Um, cool. So our last, uh, our last um, presentation in this room, Julius Robert. Here he's a local in Tasmania. He works for the University of Tasmania as a system administrator, um, managing the uh, Nectar Research Cloud, um, which I use for some of my projects as well. So, um, and so he usually fills a room at Taslog uh, talking about uh, virtualization or um, or system management. Uh, he's given talks on Ansible uh, and Proxmox before, and today he's actually going to give you all an introduction to uh, the system configuration tool Ansible. So. Julius. Hello. Hello. Okay. Thanks for coming. Um, so, Ansible. Um, one of the reasons I, um, all right, let's start at the beginning. So, when I moved into my old job, I worked as a sysadmin for several years. We had no configuration management at all. Um, I gave Puppet a go, um, and I spent about a week at it, and I think after about the week, I had some understanding about how somebody might go and implement Puppet next time. Um, and so I did give it a go, then uh, an, like a, a restart, um, and look, I wasn't getting as much traction as I wanted. Um, and uh, we ended up um, not implementing. I went to a Linux conference um, not long thereafter and I spoke to some people and one of the people mentioned this tool called Ansible. So um, it was a thing that did something like Puppet, I learned. So um, I decided to give it a go. Um, so what it does, um, I will demonstrate for you. Um, just a bit of a catch-all slide. Um, why we do um, automation at all of configuration management. Um, we can see that um, time versus productivity. Uh, we get to a plateau um, where unless we're doing some kind of automation, um, we, we are unable to do uh, re repeat implementations and our infrastructure fails to scale effectively. So whether it is Ansible or Puppet or something, um, once you reach a certain sk stage, you can't be um, managing hosts on a host-by-host -host basis anymore. Um, so, seems like a trite question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, hands up everybody who's ever used SSH. Okay, ha keep your hands up. Um, if you have SSH'd into more than one host to do the same thing to those hosts. Uh, hands up who wished after about the fourth host there was a better way to do this. Excellent. Just look around the room. That's everybody, right? Um, so straight away we realise um, that we all share the similar needs and Ansible fills that niche. Now a lot of people, people probably here already know what Puppet is and you, you're thinking, well that's not, what the not the same as what Puppet does. And you're right, Ansible and Puppet aren't the same. Many environments will run Ansible and Puppet together. Um, and so I'll show you uh, what is the niche that Puppet, uh, sorry, Ansible fills and why I think it's useful. Uh, so the rest of the talk is going to be um, a live demo style. So you all need to be able to see the screen. Um, can everybody read all of that okay? Yes, nods up the back? Okay, all right. Um, so to start with, all of this content is available on my Git repo. Um, that is on the slide earlier and, and that's it there as well. The idea of the presentation is that you can follow through here um, and then if you want to, you can just um, grab this Git repo, this readme is here and you should be able to replicate all of this at home on some infrastructure that you might have. Um, you don't need anything significant for Ansible, that's one of the fantastic things. It, um, it is analogous to um, simply SSHing to a remote machine and doing some things, or analogous to um, implement, uh, sorry, SSHing to multiple machines and doing the same thing. So you really don't need a significant amount of infrastructure. The, connect, the connection um, method doesn't use SSL or anything like uh, Puppet does, it just all happens over SSH. So chances are you already have the infrastructure you need in place to do automation with Ansible already. 
and if you're lucky enough, then it's packaged for your chosen distributions. And for Debian and Ubuntu, it already is. So in that case, it's just a simple app get install. Um, Git's not a uh, requirement for Ansible, but it is a requirement for some of the functionality we're using today. Um, and so uh, that's installed there as well. Um, there are two versions of Ansible, most of this, uh, Ansible 1, uh, .x and 2.x. 2.x isn't released yet. Um, there are some subtle semantic versions um, between the 1.x releases, but um, in my experience, there's, it's nothing significant. Um, here's the, uh, so this is just some bootstrapping stuff. I'm not gonna do it on this instance up here because I've done it all already. Um, but I've just cloned the directory up here. Um, we have some files that I'll go through in a minute. Um, and that's it to start with. So um, the first thing to have a look at is Ansible hosts. So Ansible will talk to um, a list of hosts defined in this file. Um, and so we can, we can group hosts together by giving them an arbitrary name and specifying them. This name here must be reachable, so um, in, uh, it's on this particular host, those um, entries exist in etc. hosts, but they could be reachable via DNS or whatever. You can also use IP addresses if you want to. Um, so we've just got three simple uh, groups here that we'll be dealing with, and there's 10 machines in this environment that we'll be talking to in total. Um, oh, incidentally, before I get too much further, um, I'd really like to encourage you all to uh, stop and interrupt me and ask questions if, um, I, if I'm not clear or whatever, because um, these concepts will stack. So if you, if you get lost early, you're just not gonna keep up. That being said, it's not infinitely complicated. So, um, yes, hello. Yeah, so, and good question. Um, so, uh, yes and no. Um, in the first instance, we just install Ansible on localhost, um, and that's all, and that's available in your package repository. Um, there is no agents or require or anything required other than um, Python on the remote host. Um, the reason why is uh, we'll go through that in a minute, but Ansible modules. Um, package up your requested command or set of commands into a Python script and they inject those over to Python on the remote host and they get executed over there. Any temporary files or whatever that uh, were delivered during that operation get removed and uh, the SSH connection closes and that's it. Yes? Which version of Python? Anything that's not uh, Python 2. Yep. Um, so um, if the bootstrapping, other than installing Python on the remote host, um, is simply installing your normal SSH infrastructure, so that would be copying your uh, public key over. Um, and in the instance that, and you can use Ansible to do that, um, in the instance that um, you don't have um, Python simple JSON, that's the, the only um, package requirement, um, to make Ansible run. If you don't have um, Ansible running already, you can send uh, the raw, uh, use the raw module to run a raw SSH command. Now that's, we're sk skipping ahead a little bit. We'll go through what modules are and all of that in a second. This is just the bootstrap phase. All right, so let's start at the beginning. We've already gone through the contents of etc. Ansible hosts. That's what's happening up here. Um, so let's deconstruct this command. So we're using the Ansible binary we're using the Ansible binary to talk to the group of hosts that we've defined up here called push mode hosts. Um, we are going to, I'll skip this argument for a little second. We're gonna run the command module, which is effectively a remote shell. Um, and the argument that we're gonna to pass to that module is this. Um, so basically connect to all of those remote machines and run date, that's all this does. Um, so I'll omit the O for a second. So it's connected to the three machines as defined above, it's run date and it's given us the output. So if I then go back and I add in the 
hyphen zero, it just puts everything on one line, which makes for easier reading, I think. Um, the green corresponds with a OK on standard out, um, or standard error, rather, um, and it would return red if there was some problem. Sometimes you'll get errors with some hosts, and um, it's easy to pick out through the colors. So you don't have to use this minus M command in this context. It's superfluous. You're quite able to omit that because it's the default uh, module um, available to uh, Ansible. So we can do the same thing there, and it, we get the same result. Um, so the um, just like SSH, if I was to SSH to Ansible 2, um, I'm the Ubuntu user on this machine, then it's going to try and connect to the Ubuntu user on the remote machine, just like SSH. So if I say, who am I to all of those machines, um, then it'll tell me that I'm Ubuntu. Now you'll notice then that um, it didn't all return straight away, like some hosts are faster than others. Um, obviously there's some network latency involved there, but more significantly, Ansible will batch the commands to the remote hosts in groups of five. Um, so it'll send, it'll do the first five, and then the next five, and the next five. Um, you don't have to do that. You can specify an argument, uh, F, which is the number of forks, and it'll run all of those. So it'll now send 20 of them out at once, and you'll get all the return backs much more quickly. Um, so if, for example, imagine the scenario that um, you don't want to run your remote command as Ubuntu, you want to run it as root instead, well, you could connect as root with hyphen hyphen user root, um, or you can also use sudo, which is what I'm doing today, because um, these machines were set up with um, passwordless sudo, so it was just easier than root keys. Um, so in this instance, if I run minus F, uh, minus S rather, it does all the same stuff, but I've connected as root instead. Um, so you might get tired of specifying minus F20 every time, so you can um, globally define um, how many forks you want to run in, um, in this Ansible config. So we'll, I'll just do that now and change it to 20 for the sake of this. Uh, so now I don't need to bother um, with that, and it should all be a bit quicker. Um, so, um, I've mentioned earlier that by default the module that we run is called the command module, but there are heaps and heaps and heaps of other modules. Um, one of them is called ping, um, and it does what you might expect a ping module would do, just go to the remote host and say, hi, are you there? Yes, I'm there, everything's happy. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the modules that are available because there are an awful lot of them, but I'll go through some of them. So Ansible doc has um, all the documentation that you would need to run any of these modules um, against your remote hosts. Um, so there are modules, for example, there are ZFS modules and there are Apache modules and YUM modules and all kinds of stuff to do all kinds of things to those remote, remote machines. Um, so I should go through that more slowly because I expect some of you are probably actually interested in finding out. I think I've lost my session. Uh, that Ansible doc command incidentally plays havoc with my SSH session. Um, so I'm not going to do that. Um, Actually, no, I need to. So in this instance, um, there are a good number of docs, of, um, modules available, 183 of them. And we'll go through the list one more time and deal with any SSH troubles. Ansible docs obviously just running locally. I don't know why I have issues with it. So I'll just scroll through those to give you some indication of some of the stuff that you can hope to do with um, Ansible. Now, the reason that all of these are um, significant is because um, it saves you having to construct a normal command that you might have done with SSH. Um, you, there are um, all of the hard work's done for you and it just passes variables up to the command line so you can execute things in an intelligent kind of way. So to give you an example, 
Um, here's the doc for apt, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and I don't know why that minus s was there. Okay, so um, these are some of the arguments that you can pass to the apt module. Um, you can say, um, force a package installation, install the recommended packages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, get rid of it, whatever. So um, in the instance that we wanted to connect to a group of machines called push mode hosts, um, display the output all in one line, run a sudo, run the apt module, pass the argument, package name of NTP, um, state is absent. Um, I think you can probably imagine what that would do, because we've been through all of that already. That's going to re remove the NTP package from all of those hosts. Um, but I'm saying actually only do it to the host name that's called Ansible2. Um, so that's just getting going to the remote host app, get remove, um, and it's telling me that everything's okay. So um, now um, we can do the opposite. We can go to all the hosts. Um, in that group, actually, instead of removing it, um, the state is now installed. Um, I'm asking you to update the cache, but only update it if it's older than about that. Um, except I'm not going to say update cache because it'll take too long. Sorry. So you'll notice uh, here that we passed that uh, Ansible command to these. Um, groups of machines defined in push mode hosts. You'll recall that there's three of those. Two of those already had NTP because we didn't take it off. Um, so they've just said that nothing's changed. Um, and the third host where something actually happened, it's passed us some output and said that everything's okay. So that's pretty good for one task. But what if you wanted to do more than one task? Um, well, that's what playbooks are for. And we use a separate binary to execute playbooks. That, that's called Ansible Playbook. So Ansible Playbooks are a YAML file that is, uh, follows a particular structure. And they allow us to organize multiple, playbook, uh, multiple tasks together um, and then execute them as a bunch. So um, this is probably the simplest of playbooks you can think of. Um, um, we'll just go down from the top. So it is. Um, you remember in the Ansible command, we specify which host we want to run the, sorry, groups we want to run the command against. In this instance, that's what that's about. Um, that's the name of this um, playbook, and that's the user that we want to run it as. Um, and in this instance, the task we want to run is simply um, do the invoke the pin module like we did a second ago, and that's the that's the only. Um, action to require action is um, is invoke the ping module. So to run that, very simply, so I'll just scroll back up to the top. Um, so you'll notice the first thing that goes through is it gathers facts about these machines. You know, those of you familiar with Puppet would be familiar with Factor, and it's a um, information gathering tool that um, parses all sorts of useful pieces of information about the remote node, like what Linux distribution it's running and uh, what the host name is and you know what the IP addresses are and all that sort of stuff. Um, those facts get um, gathered every time we run an Ansible um, run against a remote host because those f uh, facts can be used to influence the behavior of playbooks. Um, so we'll come back to that in a second. Um, so in this instance, it's invoked ping. Everything was OK. And then at the end, in this particular playbook, there's only one task. Um, and then at the end, it said this is, everything was OK with all of those hosts, and we didn't have any troubles. Um, incidentally, um, if I just cat that file again, if there was more than one task, um, you, you just queue them up down here. And I'll show you that of an example of that in a second. In fact, better yet, I'll show you now. So um, what we do here, um, well, we're going to use the Ansible push mode. So that's the mode that we used um, just then with the ping. But instead, we're going to use it instead of pinging to install NTP. Um, but NTP is um, slightly more um, 
complicated in that um, for in this example we want to tell the NTP server to use the sorry the NTP daemon um, on the remote hosts to use this specific NTP server. Obviously, that's not a real NTP server; it's just there for demonstration purposes. Um, so we saw the playbook earlier. In addition, we've got this uh, vars section. So this is a global variable, if you like, that are available for um, use later on in your playbook and in any included playbooks, including this one down here. Um, it's, um, it's somewhat useful to modularize your playbooks so that you can call them from different locations and you can just pass the variables in as defined up here. So today we'll be doing that. We'll be using the NTP module um, sorry, the NTP um, task via an include, both in this mode plus in Ansible pool, which we'll be doing a bit later on. So then if we go through um, this file, Um, so you'll notice that the task file uh, is a slightly different format than the um, playbook file that we were discussing a second ago, in only that it omits all that header stuff. Um, and the reason that's the case is it's designed to, as, to be in, used as, a, as an include. Yes? The question was, what does the hyphen mean? Um, the answer to that is uh, I have no... I don't know, other than it's required to make it run. Uh, yes, it's YAML, yeah. Okay, so the... Okay. okay, so the answer to the what is the hyphen question is it's a YAML file and, and hyphens define the start of a list in that context. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, as I said a second ago, we, in, the, um, in these task files, we're omitting all the header stuff that existed up here because the tasks are designed to be included as, a, um, as an include. But um, as for the, the syntax of each of these individual tasks, um, they are exactly the same. So um, if you squint a little bit, this... Um, command here looks almost the same as the one that we ran via the Ansible command earlier. It's just formatted ever so slightly differently because now it's running inside a playbook instead of being run um, by itself on the command line. Um, that's a reasonably important concept. Does everybody, can I just get nods if that makes sense? Yep. Um, okay, so um, we've covered that. That's installing the package. So now what we're going to do is um, we've already got an NTP config um, that we want the remote, remote hosts to use. Um, and that's a template file. Um, and we'll go through how templates work in a second. Um, and you'll notice here that we've got this little conditional saying where Ansible host name is not equal to Time Lord. So all that's saying is um, if I ran this playbook against all of our infrastructure, because I wanted all of our machines to look at the same NTP server, um, if our local NTP server, uh, and I want all of, our all of our infrastructure to point to our local NTP server, and that local NTP server talks out to the world, I don't want to configure the local NTP server to talk to itself. That would make no sense. So in this instance, we're just excluding a server called Time Lord, because that's what my local NTP server's called, from this playbook, um, and every other machine in our environment will, will come and talk to it. Yep. Um, for this to be, for this code to syntactically work, this, this would be a whole string of X's, um, if you're following from what I was talking about before. Um, anyway, the takeaway is you can use facts. This came from the fact, um, and you, you can use conditionals to determine whether or not you want to execute a particular task based on a fact. That's, that's all that matters here. Um, so um, you can also use the, um, um, instead of, uh, so you can also use a file copy uh, module 
to copy a file remotely, or in this instance, we're using a template module. So that says take a file in this particular format, which, can somebody tell me what that format is? Ginger2, yeah. Um, so that's a, a file templating format. Um, and we can um, use the variable that we defined earlier in the scope, which was all the Xs, um, in this template. And when it gets rendered on the remote side, um, just a normal plain looking um, config file will get written out. So if I just do that, um, we'll come back to the rest of this content in a second. Um, if I, we actually look at the template that we referenced up there, um, and I'm grepping for the little markers that delimit the um, start of the template. Um, imagine a, a full NTP conf, which I'm sure you've all seen before, in the little line where I would have server. I've now got server and the little stands are there. Um, that, when it gets written out on the remote host, will have lots of X's in it instead. Um, so, um, that's how the template works. Um, as for the facts, um, and you'll recall up here I used Ansible hostname as one of the facts. There are heaps and heaps of facts available. Um, and if you're not sure what facts uh, you can use in order to set up your templates, uh, sorry, to set up your uh, conditionals or uh, whatever in your tasks, you can use the setup module and output them in a tree format. Um, which I will run and the, out, the out, uh, resulting content will get put in a subdirectory of temp called facts. Um, remember I said that the facts get gathered every single time you run a playbook, um, or Ansible for that matter. Um, all this is doing is just putting them in a directory on localhost so you can grep them or peruse them um, quickly to see what attributes you're getting back from remote hosts and what attributes you might like to be um, um, using in your playbooks. So if you're still following, um, we're now going back, at, we're looking back at this file that we were discussing earlier and we, um, we mentioned the, this variable declaration, the including of the tasks file, uh, how this includes a template file and all the rest of it. Um, so that's the infrastructure that you kind of need. It's, it's not necessary to use the include, but it's there for demonstration purposes. The crux of all of that is, in the same way that we executed the ping um, playbook earlier, um, this is the NTP one, um, and we know that we're going to run that against all the push mode hosts, um, and so we just run it like that. So for each host, it'll do each of those tasks, and each of those tasks um, are mentioned, are grouped together. So we know that, for example, um, each host had successfully uh, received a copy of the templated NTP conf, and each host successfully did all the other steps. Um, in the instance that Ansible 2 failed to uh, return success with this particular step, it's excluded for um, the rest of the steps. Um, it, in the same way, if it was unreachable in the first instance, you're not going to get a whole heap of errors with each step because that host r remains to be un, uh, unavailable. Um, so then if we go to all of those hosts, we can just use Ansible again to see what the content of etc. NTP looks like. So I hope this is familiar now, but it should be um, run the Ansible uh, binary against the group of hosts defined as push mode, put the output on one line, send it to the default module, which is command, and uh, this is the argument, um, grep that out of NTP conf. So we see that those three hosts have this particular line in their NTP conf, and um, so we, we're happy that, um, that that file's in place and NTP is pointing in the right direction. 10 minutes to go, wow. Um, okay, so at the moment what we've been doing is uh, from localhost pushing to remote hosts. Um, that's okay, but it doesn't scale very well um, because um, those remote hosts are, for example, in this instance, only running our customised version of NTP um, by virtue of the fact that we pushed that file out a minute ago. If we left it a year, there's no guarantee whatsoever that that same NTP config is in place. 
Um, so if you um, switch your mindset around to Puppet, you know that um, every 15 minutes, Puppet nodes will go to the Puppet Master and go, what should I be doing now? Puppet says, you should be doing this, and if anything's changed, it'll change it back. Um, what I'm about to show you is not especially analogous to that, but what it does do is make sure that your remote hosts are what you say they should be on, a, on an interval that you specify. Um, so the way that Ansible implements that is we basically install Ansible on the remote host, the whole Ansible binary and all its supporting infrastructure. Um, all of that gets installed on the remote host and instead of running Ansible, uh, you run Ansible pull and it pulls down some config from Git and applies it to itself. So we'll go through that now. Um, so when, I'll start with a command and we'll, we'll work backwards, it's probably slightly easier. Um, so what this is saying is um, SSH to the node called Ansible 6, um, run the Ansible pull command um, and um, pull this git repo down and put it in that directory um, and that's the branch that we, that we care about. Um, so um, that's all reasonably straightforward. You'll probably be wondering what config that that server would then apply to itself. Um, that config is defined in this file which is in the root of, um, of that repository called local.yaml. So if I just cat that out, um, we can see that this will be run by localhost via Ansible pool. Um, it's not running like all of Ansible runs now, running against multiple hosts. Ansible pools just, just runs Ansible um, against itself. Yep. Yeah, uh, good question. At the moment, uh, there's no frequency. We haven't got to that. So it runs out of cron to, to, um, because it's, there's no agents or um, daemons involved in Ansible. So in order to get that functionality, we'll, we'll populate a cron entry. Um, we'll go through that in a second. Um, so um, in this, so we just make sure that Ansible 6 has actually got Ansible on it by calling the apt module. Um, and it's already got Ansible on there because it's told me that after it executed that um, command, nothing changed. So now um, we'll run the command that I just went through a second ago. Um, so Ansible 6 is going to git, pulling down the whole repository to local into that directory, then ex executing local.yaml, which is this file up here. Um, and local.yaml is exactly the same file as we used for Ansible push. Remember, it's the same include, um, except th in this instance, we're just using a different variable for NTP server. That's reasonably important too. Can, we, can you nod if you've got that? Got a, a, there's about half of you nodding. Yeah, okay. Well, you could copy the binary. Um, it's, yeah, maybe it would, it, I mean, Ansible pool is probably not packaged by itself, but if you had a means by getting that binary onto the host and all its supporting infrastructure, then that should work. Um, but remember, um, Ansible is only as effective as um, the user it's running as on the remote host. So if that remote host has got root everywhere, um, then, um, then that's a problem in and of itself. Ansible is just gonna add some automation around that, but probably no, not specifically. Um, so you can see we've SSH to the remote machine. We can see it's now running Ansible pool. Right now, it's talking to Git. It's pulling down the repository. Um, it's then running through the, um, the local.yaml, uh, which just applies um, the NTP conf in exactly the same way that the push did a second ago. Um, so if that uh, worked correctly, then um, we should expect to see um, wires in NTP config on that host because that's, um, that's what we specified in our 
uh, local playbook. Um, so this is not my work, this, um, but if I just show you the contents of this file, Ansible has a whole heap of supporting documentation, all sorts of examples and whatever, and one of the examples that is supplied, supplied on their website um, allows you to uh, set up Ansible pool um, on remote host via cron like we were discussing a second ago. So in order to um, deploy that to a, a bunch of remote machines, um, we can use Ansible um, to configure all those remote machines to use Ansible pool to configure themselves. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, so we'll just go through that quickly. As I said, this is not my config. I just got this off the internet, but it's, it works perfectly well. So in relation to the schedule, you can see now um, this variable is used to populate the cron module a bit further down in the code. Um, so in this instance, the um, Ansible will Ansible pool will speak to git every minute. That's highly aggressive and I don't recommend you do that. I've just got it here for demonstration purposes. Um, uh, so which, which cron table are we populating? Where does the log file go? Uh, some other variables that are um, pertinent. Um, install the Ansible package. Um, this here is using the uh, variables directly. Remember earlier we used them in the template. This is using them in this actual file. Um, create the cron tab entry, set up log rotate for the pool and other bits and pieces. Um, suffice to say that um, that is a sufficient enough playbook to configure all our pool mode hosts to run, um, that's not what I want, It's con uh, that's sufficient to get all our pull mode hosts to um, to pull down from Git. Now I've got a bit of a problem here because it's so we just need to run it. Ansible playbook. So now every every minute, each one of those hosts is going to go and do that thing. Yep. Um, now I know because I set it up earlier that they're already doing that. Um, so if we e ask each of them what their NTP conf looks like, it looks like that. Um, so um, now you probably want to know, well, if that's all happening out of cron and they're all pulling stuff down locally and there's no puppet master anymore in the middle to orchestrate everything, how do I know which of those remote hosts have done what? Um, well, we already configured in the playbook earlier that they ought log to uh, this particular log file, uh, var log ansible pull log on their local host. So we can use the fetch ansible module to pull all of those files back here um, and put them in a directory called fetched. Um, so um, we can then see all the files that we've pulled back from the remote hosts. These are all the log files that were produced by cron on each of those machines. Um, and any error produced um, via Ansible will be prefixed by that word, so we know that everything's running sweet. Um, so at the moment, the how much time have I got left? No minutes. One minute. Okay, we're pretty close. Um, I'll skip through this. Um, so Ansible Galaxy is a way for, uh, for example, with the NTP stuff, there were those six or seven steps that I specified. Somebody's already worked out how to do that, right? I don't have to work that out again. The way that Ansible's implemented that is, this, is by this functionality called roles. Um, and the way that roles work is you install them onto your machine by, by virtue of Ansible Galaxy. So I've already had a look at this guy's um, um, code. Um, and I'm happy with what his NTP module does, so I can just install it locally by going like that. Um, and then I can see what roles I've got available. It's only this one. And then I can apply a playbook on my remote hosts, and instead of including um, the task YAML that I'd been including previously, now I just apply the role called that, the role accepts some variables, one of which is that, um, and then 
um, I can run that against a third group of hosts um, called roll mode, um, and they will um, hopefully have their NTP configs configured with Zs instead. So um, if we have a look at those ones, um, they've all used the, the roll way of configuring themselves. Um, well, in this instance, I've used the roll way because we used Ansible push. And so by those three different methods, we've got um, three different uh, config file variants in production. Um, and we can see those there. So that's the end of the content, if we've got any questions. Um, down the front here. Yes, um, you can put um, colon port number or SS, uh, SSH um, proxy, all sorts of stuff in this host's file and to help you navigate around the place. Yep. Up the back there in the yellow. Uh, the sudo, sudo password, um, the way the Ansible people would suggest you probably do it is with root key certificates, and in most of the case, that's how I do it. In this instance, the password require, sorry, sudo requires no password. In the instance that sudo does require a password, Ansible will prompt you, and you type it in. Um, I don't, I hope it doesn't prompt you for every host, um, but I, it does? Okay, fair enough. Um, that would be annoying then, yeah. Yeah, don't do that, don't use sudo then, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Julius, for letting us know about uh, Ansible and uh, for this uh, somewhere where you can put all your playbooks. <laughs>